good evening. Okay, so I am not intoxicated. I have one of those headaches that just makes you slur. It's so bad. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So uh, we're going to get through this because once I get started, the adrenaline will hit and we'll be all in. For those of you that have been praying for Dougie, I thank you. He is home. Uh, we think it's his GERDs that has turned into a bacterial infection. And he's uh, been in a bad sorts for some time. He was totally dehydrated, so they've had him in the hospital all day. They almost kept him overnight. He's home. He's had all kinds of different drips, and we're waiting to see how he does for the next couple of days as to whether he goes back. But he's doing well now. Um, Carol's family was supposed to come in uh, either yesterday or today. And they've got a lot of things to be handling local. And once they get things wrapped up and they find out when friends and family are coming in, we're going to know more about when his memorial service will be. I thank you guys for all the responses that I got when I asked for prayer for him. Um, please continue to be in prayer for them. And uh, we will be having the service here when we do have it. Um, and uh, it'll be a small church and he's got a lot of friends. So uh, it's going to look like a revival in this place. But... It was precious of him that he wanted to be here with his, with his family and friends. And uh, boy, he's going to be missed. Uh, but he went home surrounded by his family, and I know where his heart was because we got to spend a lot of hours together those last few weeks. And he was just an awesome guy. So uh, I'll keep you guys informed as we go. And uh, I'm going to try to get more lively if I can get past this headache. Took a lot of drugs, waiting for him to kick in. <laughs> I mean... Legal drugs. So, <laughs> um, I want to pass this one on to you. The reason I didn't send this out to you on prayer requests is because it happened about the same time we were going through with Carol. And I don't do a lot of announcements on Wednesdays, but this one needs to be announced. Bub, Bub and Brittany, uh, they were on a mini vacation at an Airbnb. And they decided to take the fire escape down on their way to a concert to save some time. Legal, safe. <laughs> Bob's a safety manager at work, by the way, just to add some pizzazz to the story. Stepped off, uh, stepped to go down on the ladder of the fire escape, and the entire thing just fell. So he fell two stories and completely um, destroyed his left leg. I mean, just broke into pieces. They had an external wire system holding it together after his surgery. He had to have an ambulance pick him up. He got his emergency surgery there, wherever he was at during this vacation. Uh, and he's back home. He came home yesterday, and in a week or two, he gets another reconstructive surgery. So he's got some serious work done, and he got torn up. He's just a tough guy. So they probably have been making one of those, one of those self-witnessing safety videos at work. This is what not to do on vacation. No, <laughs> he did nothing wrong. It was all the fire escape. But he's one tough guy. He'll probably be up next week doing something. Malibu Jacks, Sunday, 3 to 4.30, pizza and drinks included. Uh, they're going to have eight activities you can do, all included in the price. And it'll probably take you the whole hour and a half to do that. But if you want to do more, you can pay for more. But I don't think you'll probably have much more time to do than eight um, so drinks, food, fun, all paid for, Malibu Jacks, 3 to 4.30 for the kiddos. And uh, I hope you guys can come. It's, we've been waiting a long time for this one. It seems like it's going to really be awesome. Maybe we can talk them into doing this every year instead of going to the Hall of Horror. I mean, I mean Camden, Camden Park. Camden Park. <laughs> we'll see. All right. I won't go through anything else. Be in prayer for uh, Kimmy. Uh, going to Florida, be in prayer for uh, Josh and Vanessa and Noel, uh, Jim Gaypart, Mike Spencer, my, my brother, David Robertson, and for uh, Mark and Brenda and Mark's mother. And the old geezer that wants to go back to work too quick, Pastor Smith, make sure he gets, make sure he listens to his wife. <laughs> All right, guys, if you'll stand with me, we will open in prayer. Uh, my, haven't heard anything else from my, my wife's friend, Janelle, who had a tumor the size of an orange in her head, and she's pregnant, and they did surgery today, I think, and they are worried she will lose the baby through this surgery. So continue prayers for her. And always, 
Zishon, for him personally, for his mother, for his village. All right, let's pray, guys. Thank you very much. Heavenly Father, we come to you now. Lord, we stop everything. You are our Heavenly Father, our Lord, our God, the one who loves us most, the one who was willing to give anything for us, the one that wants to just be close to us no matter how many times we walk away, the one that wants our love more than anyone else. Lord, you're so awesome. You're so loving. Help us to see it. Help us to rejoice in it. Help us to give you worship and praise today with all of our heart through the power of your spirit. I pray that you'd fill this place, fill our hearts and souls. I pray you'd make us hungry for your word. I pray you'd bring it alive and anoint it and illuminate it. Let it be received through your power. And let us worship you unashamedly together as your children with everything that we have. Lord, the people that we put on this list. I pray for Carol's family especially. That they would feel you and see you, Lord, in these, in these times more awesomely than they ever have. And Lord, I do rejoice to know what Carol's seeing. And I do rejoice knowing that we're going to be there with him to see it very soon as well. But Lord, I can just imagine the things he's experiencing right now. Pray you'd be with Bob. Keep him out of pain. Keep him strong. Heal him quickly. Thank you for protecting him when this could have been deadly to him. I lift up Jim Gabehart and Mike Spencer and my brother David Robertson and Mark and Brenda and his mom, Josh, Vanessa, Noel, Lona, Kimmy, and Janelle. Lord, this girl whom my wife knows we don't know, but... It got to our attention, and we lift her up, and we claim the blood of Jesus Christ over her. Protect her. Protect her child, Lord. We praise you. We love you. In your precious son, Jesus Christ's name, we pray. And they all said, amen. amen. Savior say Thy strength indeed is small Child of weakness watch and pray Find in me thine all in all Jesus paid it all All to him I owe Sin Ew. Mm-hmm. 
makes me miss him. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for your word. Bring it alive now. Let us be hungry. Let us be open. Let us be anointed with your spirit to receive your word and let everything be done just to draw closer and understand you more and serve you better because you so deserve it for all that you've done for us. In Jesus Christ's precious name, amen. All right. You find my spot here. Unusual name, but you'll see how it comes together.
Secrets from the Royal Throne. Uh, yeah, boy. I don't know how many of you know the stories of the different judges, but of all the incredible... <laughs> see your face, David. <laughs> of all the stories, of all the judges, I have to say that tonight's might be my favorite one. Okay? Uh, we're in chapter 3, and we stopped at verse 6. And I'm going to give you a quick catch-up for those who weren't here, and we're going to jump in because we have two judges to cover tonight, and they are good stories. Okay? So... <clears throat> here's where we are. Joshua's passed away. Does anybody remember how old he was? 120. Almost. That was Moses. 110. 110. Booyah. And uh, all of his generation soon followed after, leaving none that had witnessed all the wonderful, glorious things God had done firsthand anymore. And um, chapter 3, when we got into it, opened with a list of all the Canaanite people that the Israelites had unfaithfully allowed to stay. And uh, it was a mess load, if you guys remember. And it was showing where they were. But even worse than that, what made God so angry was not that they just stayed when they shouldn't have, but what was the one thing he warned them about all the way through Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. He's like, if you let these guys stay, you're going to cross paths with them. You're not only going to let them stay in society, you're going to intermarry with them and you're going to take their culture to be yours. And that's what made God so angry. And uh, because they were mixing socially and religiously in their marriages. And um, God meant this so drastically. This was such a big deal to him that 3,400 years later, Paul's still talking about it. Okay? And I'm just going to throw this out there because I have covered this about twice in the last two years as he's covered it again and again in the Old Testament. But if he repeats something that many times... There's reasons, and I wish to goodness you guys knew how many times people intermarried, and I don't mean racially, any racial marriage is just fine with God, okay? If you intermarry, it means you marry someone of a different faith. That's what he was talking about here, and that's what Paul's talking about 3,400 years later in Corinthians. And I don't just mean, oh, a Christian married a Buddhist, or a Christian married a Hindu. I don't even... I mean, it comes down to a Christian marries someone who's lukewarm and claims to be a Christian. Here's the deal. Let's start with this verse, and then I'm just going to throw one point out there and drive it home, because even recently in my life, again, I can't tell you how many times I've had to counsel with people and watch them splinter and watch people fall away from their walk with God because they thought they could do this. Okay? 2 Corinthians 6, 14. 3,400 years later, after God had warned them, don't do this, okay? Obviously, somebody didn't listen because Paul's still talking about it, right? Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Yoked, put together, two oxen, plow in the field. You got little two-foot Jethro and big four-and-a-half-foot Bruto, and they're trying to go in the same yoke. Is it going to work? No, they're going to run in circles, they're not going to do any work, right? Somebody's going to fail. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership, listen to the reasoning, pay attention. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? If your heart is really light and you really do, really do, really do want God, chase God, want to live for God, and you got somebody over here who could care less and wants a good time, how, if you, Want that relationship so bad you're thinking about doing it even though God says no? I'm telling you, your first problem is if you're supposed to be that in love with God, you better stop and check yourself at the door and really ask some questions. Because if, if a pastor has to tell you, no, you shouldn't do this, you're not loving God the way you think you are. If you're ready to match up with somebody that might draw you away from them, that doesn't love your God like you do, that doesn't see that he's everything. If you want to share your life with somebody that doesn't even know your God, no matter how awesome they are, you better check yourself at the door because your faith is probably not real. And if it is and you do that anyway, chances are it won't be. So 
What fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? Doesn't mean you don't love them. Doesn't mean you don't love them even more. Doesn't mean you don't be their best friend and witness to them and die for them. It means you love them in every conceivable way. Maybe even more than you would with a relationship. But it means you love them in such a way you want to win them, show them Christ because you do care. Not because you want to get involved in their dark world and be taken away from your God. Does that make sense? doesn't mean you look down on anybody. It means you might love them even more. But you love them by really loving them. You love them by caring about what's going to happen to them versus what you can get out of them in the relationship. That's real love. Does that make sense? I wish people could get that because as a pastor, I've seen this destroy more people. And I've seen more people say, yeah, but love is love. Shut up. You're exactly right, but loving someone means you care about them intimately, their soul, their whole being, not just what you can get in happiness from them. So, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God said. I will make my dwelling among them, walk among them, and be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst, be separate from them. Touch no unclean thing, and then I will welcome you. And then I will welcome you. Notice that catch? If you would prefer them, if you'd prefer to live that way, if you prefer that over me, okay. I, I'm not going to stop you. But don't expect me to roll out a welcome mat because you don't have one for me. I'm here waiting. That's what he's saying. And I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters to me, says the Lord God Almighty. I, I just... If he talks about it 3,400 years later, and this is what I want you to see. This is why I started it with that, to show you this was not Old Testament, right? This is still New Testament. It's still talking about it. But this is what I want you to see. This whole thing is starting, this whole book of Judges, primarily for this reason. They not only didn't get rid of them, they completely intermingled their social, religious, and love life with them, and it destroyed them. It's the whole reason that for 400 years, Israel went through hell. Because of this one thing. So you can't really stress it enough if God's stressing it that much. And if you remember from last week, this is how much he emphasizes it. Okay, God in his anger sent Jesus Christ himself in a Christophany, a pre-incarnate appearance. We know it was him by the way he talked, the way he allowed himself to be worshipped, the way he spoke. It was Christ. So if the king comes to give the message, it's getting pretty dire. He came up from Gilgal because he wanted to say, hey, remember back here at Gilgal? When we made that covenant, I'm here to tell you, you're screwing up. And I'm here to tell you, it's your last call. And I'm here to tell you, I'm tired of of trying to play the game. So if you don't want to get rid of them, go ahead, marry them. And you're going to have one heck of a time to pay for this. But I'm telling you personally, I'm here to tell you one more time. I'm just going to let it happen. I'm not going to try to drive them out for you anymore because you've chosen to do this. I'm going to give you what you want. And then 400 years, they paid for it. More than that, but that was the beginning. So God did it. He said, I'm going to leave them here because it's what you want. I'm going to leave them here to test your heart. Remember when he said that last week? Here's what the test is. It's not the test for him. He knows what you're made of, right? The test is for you because you think you got it down. You think you're loving God. You think you're living for God. You think you got faith. And then he says, okay, here's your test. I didn't get rid of them. Are you going to marry in? Are you going to choose their gods? Are you going to walk that path with them? Okay, the test was for you. Do you see how you really didn't love me? Do you see how I really did tell you the truth? The test was for them to see their faith. The test was for the world to see what they were made of. Not for God. God knew. Whenever God tests us, it's not for his benefit. He knows the answer. When God tests you, puts you through a trial, he's doing it in love. He's testing you so you can see you. So you can make changes. So you can go back to what you thought you were all along when you realize you weren't. Because he loves us. I hope that makes sense to you. Anytime God tests you, it's never for him. It's for you to grow your faith, to maybe have it for the first time, to see that you don't have it if you don't. That's why he tests us, because he loves us. Now, so Jesus appeared on his own and said, (laughs) this is how serious it is, guys. You better get with it. And this was the beginning of the ball rolling for the whole book of Judges, okay? Now, um, God's... Blessing and protection was going to be lifted for a time because they were in their pride and rebellion and they did this. Uh, And he was hoping that in distress they would turn back. So now, 
after Joshua's death, this next generation just declined quick. All right? And I won't leave this picture up a long time, Brent. Uh, so they fell into worship of the Baals and the Ashtorah and everything. They, by this time, by the second generation that we're into now, they had fallen into every kind of worship. They were actually even sacrificing their own children in some places. All right? And uh, this is where we joined the story. This is where we left off. Brenda said, you left those idols up way too long last week, and I didn't like it. <laughs> so I got rid of them. They're gone. Pretty map. Pretty map of Israel. More later. Thank you, dear. Don't tell me I don't listen to my wife. I ain't stupid. 36 years for nothing. No. All right, here we go. So that was the introduction. That's how we got here. You needed to see that to understand all that's going to happen today. Now we're getting into the first two judges. Are you ready? Say amen. All right. <clears throat> Verse 7, chapter 3. <clears throat> So the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and Asherahs. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. Third time we've heard that. And he sold them into the hand of Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. That was hard to say once. I think God does this to be funny. He makes me repeat it five times in this. <laughs> We're going to go for it. And the children of Israel served Cushan Rishathaim eight years. When the children of Israel cried out, did you catch that? King of Mesopotamia came in, put them under bondage in fear, killed many of them. They're paying homage to him regularly now, and they served him for eight years now. Okay? That's all said quickly. I want you to catch what's happening. When the children of Israel cried out to the Lord eight years later, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the children of Israel who delivered them. Othniel, you guys remember the name, son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel. He went out to war, and the Lord delivered Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. And his hand prevailed over Cushan Rishathaim. So the land had rest for 40 years. Then Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. Now, I want to recap on this. First of all, Othniel was the first judge. What I want you to understand, these first two judges we cover today, they're awesome men. Okay, it's like it starts out with the judges being everything God would see in an awesome guy. And the moral climate and the character of Israel declined so rapidly and so horribly as God had to pick judges through the 400 years. You will notice the judges being worse and worse and worse and worse. And even the people that God has to pick are like, what? You're using him because it was that bad in the nation. What I want you to get What'd I do? Nothing? Was nothing I said I'm going to hear about later, was it? I just said it sounded like America. Oh, okay. That's cool. You can make all the comments you want as long as it wasn't because I screwed something up and don't know it. Because I've heard some bad stuff after the service a few times. We're going to stop there. Moving on. All right. Othniel. Yeah. Come to the front. All right. So... Othniel means Lion of Judah. Guess what tribe he was from? He was from a tribe of Judah. Okay, so everything about Othniel, of course we read that he was the nephew of Caleb. So he had good blood in him, and he came forward long before he was going to be made a judge when he was a nobody because Caleb needed and wanted him, and he stepped up as a valiant warrior. And he uh, captured Kiriath Sefer, which was Debir, and I think, yeah, that's where it was. And uh, he did it because Caleb wanted him to, because he needed help with the, David? Giants. <laughs> and because he did so, he won the hand of Aksa, uh, Caleb's daughter. So it was a win-win situation. Now, this is what I want you to get. God does not waste a word. I got to move on because we got so much good stuff to cover. But uh, they were under subjection from this Canaanite king for eight years and let me show you. I had to show you a bigger picture. So here's Israel from a distance, okay? So this king, King Kushan Rishathaim, is translated Kushan of double wickedness. This was, you can play the bad boys theme here. That's who this guy is, okay? Now, this is where he came from. It says Mesopotamia. That's just a sweet word if you look it up. That's, there's no one that doubts this. This is the old name. Aram Naharaim, okay? And... Um, 
It's at the northern border. It's along that fertile crescent. Remember the, where it, everything's beautiful along there? Now, if the Mesopotamian area sounds familiar, I want you to get what God was doing here. This is the first time they're overrun since they become a nation, right? Mesopotamia, from the land of Ur in the Chaldeans, came Father Abraham. When he left his family, he left his town and his city of sin. And God said, I'm going to introduce myself to you more powerfully. And I'm going to make a great nation of you. The father of the nation of Israel came from Mesopotamia. Now that they've become the nation, all these years later, they have, the promise has been fulfilled from that one man. Now the terrible sinful place that he left to follow God, that sin has returned to be their king. Stop and think about what God did there. The very first land to take over, the very first oppressor is the very land that they left to become what God wanted them to be. The picture there is so clear. You think God makes mistakes? The things that you come out of to follow God, if you're not careful, they will quickly become your oppressor again. And it's such a picture that God gave. There are no accidents. So Othniel served Israel for 40 years, from 1350 B.C. to 1310 B.C., roughly. It's, it's pretty close. And he lived up to his name, Lion of Judah. He's from Judah, and he stood up like a lion. When the need was there, he stepped up, and he did awesome. Now, you're going to hear about, and God came and filled them with the Spirit. And then as we go into, you see why he would fill these guys, but as we go into other people... Uh, Jephthah and Samson and these others, and you're like, eh, damn, what? The filling of the Spirit was different than today. You, the Spirit indwells us, lives with us, will be with us forever, even on the other side of heaven. We will have the Spirit in us to stay in communion with God all the time. The Spirit never leaves you when you become a Christian. Why? Because you have been paid for and bought, and He indwells you because you've been made perfect. This was before Christ died. The Spirit would come upon you, would move in you to do things, and then the Spirit would depart. It did not live in you. So God could use very imperfect people if it was His will. As a matter of fact, if you guys will remember, Isaiah, 700 B.C., 150 years before the Persian king Cyrus even came to help Israel in their bondage and let them go back home to their land and rebuild their temple, Isaiah mentioned Cyrus the pagan king of Persia, and said, you will be God's man. God's spirit will come upon you, and he will use you to return his people. And God used Cyrus in history. What an incredible, how can you not believe God moment when he was literally named by name in Scripture 150 years before he was born. God even put his spirit upon Cyrus to do his will. He didn't stay there. But God's Spirit will come upon a lot of people in Judges. And what I love about Scriptures is it tells you all the ugliness and says this was a punk kid and I had to use him to save my people and my Spirit came upon him and I want you to see all of his warts and I want you to know he wasn't what I wanted him to be but I want you to know that I used him to save Israel. So we're going to see some people that don't deserve to be filled with the Spirit and God uses them. Okay, These guys, so far we've got the best of the best. Othniel was a good guy. All right, Now... Um, this first judge had a courageous and upright life. He answered the call to Caleb. He, uh, he led the people all of his days afterwards and gave them peace. And he made people follow God under him as a judge. But the very next generation, after his 40 years of peace, they fell fast and hard. You ever seen somebody leave the world Start following God and something makes them stumble. And whatever their sin was when they left God, it's like when they decide to go back, they go back with a vengeance from hell to do ten times worse than they did. It seems like that's what happens to Israel every time the judge dies that brings them out of bondage. They go back harder. So I told you guys I was going to give you, because we're all a bunch of nerds, I was going to give you a superhero for every one of these as a good memory pick. So Othniel, think about this. He's a really good man. He fights valiantly. He gets power from the woman whom he eventually marries, her father, right? Who matches that in the Marvel world? Ant-Man gets his power from the man whose daughter he marries. How many nerds in here knew that one? Yeah, come on. Yeah, all right. 
Okay, so off Neil is Ant-Man. Just live with it. We're going to get a Marvel character for every one of these, and it will stick in your head. All right, now, anybody remember the name of the woman that Othniel married? Aksa. All right. Do you know what it means? Ankle jewel. So, all right. Now, you know, I'm going to get a lot of people online that are Marvel nerds that are going to say, thank you, Doug. I'll remember that forever. So, don't know, honey, you have to support me. You, you have to support me. All right, here we go. You guys are ready for the story that just, I've been waiting for this. Here we go. Verse 12. Are you ready? All right. And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord strengthened Eglon, king of Moab, against Israel. Because they had done evil. You guys remember these names. We talked about them so much in the Old Testament. <clears throat> because they had done evil in sight of the Lord. Then he gathered to himself, talking about Eglon of Moab, gathered to himself the people of Ammon and Amalek, and went and defeated Israel and took possession of the city of Palms. Some of you might remember what that is. I'm going to remind you. So the children of Israel served Eglon, king of Moab, 18 years. Now, here's what we've got. Look at it from here. Okay? The first guy, Aram Naharaim, Came in from the north, right? Othniel took care of him. The second guy, Moab, King Eglon, came from the Moabites. You see where the Moabites are down here. They struggled with them in the beginning when they were first entering on the west, I mean on the east side. Ehud is going to be the one that they call to fight him. But here's what he does. King Eglon gets the Ammonites, which they've already struggled with. He gets the Amalekites, which they struggled with from the days they were back in the desert. Yeah. They all join together with the Moabites, and then they all join and cross over at almost the exact same place that the Israelites crossed over when they went in to take the land. And these three nations join together under King Eglon, and they take the city of Palms. The city of Palms is the city of Jericho. Again, does God waste anything? If God puts the real estate in there to mention it, he wants you to understand. Actually, the king of Eglon, I mean, King Eglon makes his palace. There. They take over enough area. They make them pay tribute. They make them be under their authority and fear. But they have this little bubble where they come in and just kind of take over. And they make their palace in Jericho. Again, listen, that's the place. That's the one place when they first came in where God did the whole miracle, saved them all. They didn't lift a finger. It was the place that God said, you can look here and remember forever what I have done. Right? And now... The place, the picture of all God did for them, his faithfulness, has become the palace for their oppressor. How many things have been in your life that God did awesomely, that were beautiful, that you saw his hand only later to be taken over again and you gave them back to the enemy? So now every time they look at Jericho, instead of remembering what God did for them, they see the palace of their oppressor. God's really... Kind of rubbing the nose and saying, I wish you'd wake up. I'm dropping you some serious signals here. So, it's, it's pretty awesome how God works. Now, the king of Eglon placed him under tribute. This is where it gets interesting. I hope you guys are listening. Israel was to serve him under his authority and make payments to him constantly. And that would assure protection from further attacks. It was kind of like the mafia, right? Now, they were under this rule and under this burden for 18 years. And then it happens. Verse 15, it's getting ready to get interesting. When the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for them. Ehud, the son of Gerah, the Benjamite. Benjamite means uh, man at my right hand, right? He was a left-handed person, so get that play on words. Man at my right hand, who's left-handed? <laughs> so uh, he was from uh, the tribe of Benjamin. Ehud, the son of Gerah, the Benjamite, a left-handed man, by him the children of Israel sent tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Ehud, listen closely, made himself a dagger. He crafted it himself. It was a double-edged and a cubit in length, and he fastened it under his clothes on his right thigh. Why? Because he was left-handed. Stop. 12, 18. Dagger about that long. He handcrafted it. He's left-handed. God puts a lot of emphasis on this. All right, here's what happens. Um, first of all, in their fear and in their helplessness, 
They cry out to God after all the mess that they've done again. And I want you to understand this, this verse starts out with, no matter how far you've fallen, how many times you've fallen, how, how bad it is, if the repentance is heartfelt, God will fall all over himself like the prodigal son's father will lift up his skirt and run to you because he's waiting to love on you. You've got to get that in your head, that that is the picture of God, even in the Old Testament where everybody says he's so wrathful. They have been being head example number one, repeatedly turning on God, and the minute they still cry out in real repentance, he comes running, if it's real. He doesn't play games. He doesn't play games. But it was real. So God's eager. Now, he raised up Ehud. Um, <sighs> there's where Othniel was. Ehud comes from the tribe of Benjamin. So that's where he originated, okay? Left-handed warrior. Um, the world did not cater to left-handers back then. You just kind of had to fit in, all right? So uh, a lot of people didn't look for left-handed equipment or left-handed ways. So it was very important that he was left-handed. I wish I had a prop up here. And we're going to show you what he does with this. And... Uh, Let's go on to the next verse and jump right in to make sure we've got time for this. Verse 17. So he brought. What does he have to do? He's the one that comes to make the tribute payment. Right? He's got to come. And he brings people with him because they don't bring a load full of cash or a credit card. They have to bring uh, fur and wool and, and oils. And they have to have a, a parade of people that are bringing all this tribute. So, but he's in charge of the tribute. All right? Here we go. So he brought the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now, Eglon was a... I am reading scripture, so get off my back. Eglon was a very fat man. If they said anything about bald, you wouldn't mind, would you? But no, I'll hear about this. <laughs> reading scripture! Eglon was a very fat man. Verse 18. And when he had finished presenting tribute... Guys, there is a picture here I'm asking you to stop and I'm asking you to pay attention to because it might be one of the biggest things you'll hear and you have probably missed it every time you've ever read this. Okay? So, it's a heads up. When he had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who carried the tribute, but he himself turned back from the stone images that were at Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. So Ehud leaves... With all of his peeps, he's, he's marching away. He's done with tribute. He passes Gilgal. What did we just say was important about Gilgal? It's the place where they were circumcised and promised themselves in a covenant to God. It's the place God gave him to have the first Passover to say, you've waited 400 years. You left Egypt with a Passover. And now you're having a Passover of completion. This is where I seal my covenant with you. I brought you where I said I would. God kept his promise. They made a promise. I will be yours forever. It's that important. This, is, this said so much about Ehud, it gives me goose pimples. He's marching home after paying tribute. He's walking past Gilgal, and he notices all of these pagan idols. He says, boys, y'all go on. I got to go back for something. That was his moment where he's like, I've had... It looks like he made the dagger. He had plans, but then he turned around and left. But then as he marches past Gilgal and he sees the place of promise from God where so many awesome things happen. This is my God's sacred place full of idols. Boys, go on. I got this. I'll be back later. And he turns and goes back. And he says, tell the king I have a secret message. It's just awesome. All right, here's how it goes. Got goose pimples already. You guys are going to like this. So he sends the party away, and he returns alone. And I do believe it was because of his remembrance of Gilgal, because why else would God answer it and say he turned back when he saw the stone idols at Gilgal? All right, now, let me, say, let me say this to you before I go on. When you and I are faced with situations, <clears throat> and you come to a moment in your life, and don't tell me you don't, you realize there's an area of your life that has something in it that resembles an idol where God used to be. God used to have this place in my heart. I used to spend this time with God. I used to do this for God. Now I do this. Tell me you haven't been there. You might be there right now. When you step into a place that used to be God's in your heart and you see that it's now something else in your life, you're seeing idols in Gilgal. And what you need to do, stop 
and turn around and do something about it. Like he did. Buddy, I'm telling you, you don't wake up tomorrow and decide to go to hell in a handbasket. You wake up with one idol at a time popping up at Gilgal and you just keep walking past and you never turn around and do something about it. If you have an idol in Gilgal, recognize it. If you love him, do something about it. And stop playing stinking games when the, when the trump's about to sound and God loves you. All right, so he turns around, he comes back. He says, King, I got a secret. <clears throat> I want you to remember this. These idols that you place... We need to remember our, our Gilgal is the fact that Jesus Christ, that moment that Jesus Christ gave his life to buy you with his blood in a covenant. You made a covenant like they made a covenant at Gilgal. Your Gilgal is Jesus Christ. When you made that covenant, this is what you did. Jesus Christ gave himself to you. Remember the Solomon verse, uh, Song of Solomon verse? I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. Jesus Christ gave himself to you in every conceivable way he can. And he says, my blood bought you. And if you choose it, then you give yourself to me. You have been purchased. You are mine. He says the same thing about a husband and a wife. You don't belong to yourself anymore. You now gave yourself to your wife. Wife, you don't belong to yourself anymore. You gave yourself to your husband. Total giving, right? God gave himself to us. He says, I purchased you with my blood. If you're serious, you belong to me. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Be an Ehud. And when you see that that covenant has been broken, go do something about it. Now, he says, I got a, I got a message for you, a secret message for you, king. He plays this so well. And he does it. He sends everybody else away. And it's just me, king. Got a message for you. It's secret. At this point, uh, I'm sure he played the king well. The king's probably in his pompous attitude thinking, oh, he's come to beg for mercy or grace or a special favor. You know, he, it's, I'm sure it's going to be something awesome. Whatever it was, King Eglon took the bait. He, sent, he said, uh, everybody, he says in verse 19 at the end, the king said, keep silent. And all who attended him went out from him. He's like, you got a secret for me? You got a secret? Everybody get out of here. Why? Because everybody else was gone. He didn't have the whole army with him. It was just Ehud. It was just Ehud who had been checked for weapons, although they missed it. And they're just going to be right outside the door. So this guy wants to give me a secret message. I'm going to give him some privacy. So he runs everybody else out, and he says, Okay, Ehud, this is so awesome. What I'm getting ready to read to you, many, many scholars say, quote, is the most vile passage in all of Scripture. That's not why I like it. I like the spirit behind it. But just got to tell you, this has a high rating. Okay? Verse 20. Are you ready? Say, oh boy. Yeah, okay. Verse 20. Let me get my notes up here. <clears throat> so Ehud came to him. Now he was sitting upstairs in his cool private chamber. Then Ehud said, now listen to this. What do he say at first? I have a message for you. Now he steps up to the king while everything's private. And I'm telling you what, what I'm getting ready to read so you can get the scene, okay? As he's stepping up, the king stands up because it looks like he's going to come and whisper it to him. He doesn't want anybody to hear. He changes it from, I have a secret message for you. As he approaches the king and the king stands for him to whisper it to him, he changes it to this. I have a secret message for you from God. And that's when it happens, okay? So, now let's read it. <clears throat> so Ehud came to him. Now he was sitting upstairs in the cool private chamber. Then Ehud said, and remember, what's the big thing about the king? He's, he's a big old boy. We'll put it that way, okay? Then Ehud said, as he steps up to him, I have a message from God for you. So he, the king, arose from his seat. Then Ehud reached with his left hand, took the dagger from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. Even the hilt went in after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade, for he did not draw the dagger out of his belly, and his entrails came out. Then Ehud went out from through the porch, shut the doors of the upper room behind him, and locked them. 
Now let's stop and read about this vile passage for a minute because there's some things you missed in here unless you read the original Hebrew, which is not a guess. It's the real thing. These words are understood, and I'll go and look them up. Okay, Ehud steps up to the king. The king stands up so he can hear him. Ehud plunges the dagger in, and that's when he says, this is a message from God. Okay, but now he stabs him so fiercely, so deeply, that this 18-inch dagger goes in, the handle passes through, the entire handle, either the, either the fat folds just fall over it, or it literally just pushes out blubbery and just swallows the handle. Either way, it probably takes part of Ehud's hand at the beginning, too. Think about this. The knife disappears in the wound. This is what it says. It's like, give me my fist back. That, that's the way the wound occurred. Imagine the passion that this, this took. Okay, this is, this is serious malice. But this is what you got to get that the original says. Ehud left the dagger in the stab wound. So it's blocking it up to a degree. Okay, just for the record, the word for entrails is parshadone. It's not guessed at. It's not this is the possible what it means. This is what it means. Are you ready? Um, it doesn't mean intestines or organs. It means, very clearly, um, feces slash crotch area, to put it lightly. Okay? So there's two potential meanings and only two potential meanings, and both of them are very unpleasant. That's why this is the most vile passage in the Old Testament. To give you what this is saying, so you know what Scripture is saying. Either it ruptured his intestines and feces spilled out in the knife wound, or more specifically what they, most scholars believe, the way this reads is he was stabbed so powerfully, so shockingly, that he lost his bowels when he was stabbed and that everything just came undone, which some people do when they pass away. But he was hit in the bowels. He was stabbed through the bowels. It was a massive impact. And the way that word reads, and the area of the body that it's talking about, it sounds like he lost his bowels, and that's what happened. Not a beautiful picture. I'm giving you this picture because it's what God was showing this for a reason. Um, now, first of all, you've got to say, wow. Thank you. Then Ehud jumps the balcony and shimmies down and he's into the night. He's gone. This one guy kills the king single-handedly and leaves town and no one catches him. Now, moving on from there. Don't tell me the Bible is not an exciting book. I know a lot of you would turn the movie off right now if you were watching the Bible and this scene came up. You'd be like, nope, done with that. God doesn't want me to see that. He wrote it. So, all right, here we go. Now, here's where it gets really interesting, and it makes sense. Verse 24, you ready? Say amen. amen. Or are you back with me after that one? All right. When he had gone, Eglon's servants came to look, and to their surprise, the doors of the upper room were locked. So they said, he is probably attending to his needs in the cool chamber. So they waited till they were embarrassed, and still he had not opened. This is all painting a picture. You realize it's very clearly saying they, they waited till they were embarrassed, and still he had not opened the doors of the upper room. Therefore, they took the key and opened them, and there was their master fallen dead on the floor. Number one, would a servant open a king's chambers with his key without permission when he was the one that locked it, unless it was a dire emergency? No, they would know that would mean death. That was a big deal, to unlock the king's doors. So they had waited a long time. Now, in layman's terms, the servants thought the king was taking a long potty break in his cool chamber. Okay? Um, this now makes sense. Okay, there's a lot of things he could be doing. Why did they assume that? If the other verse is read in Hebrew the way it was read, what do you think the smell was coming on the other side of the door? Judging from the smell and the fact that it was staying locked and he was taking a long time and he was a pretty big old boy, they're saying he's using the bathroom. And then an hour later, they're like, He's reading a long scroll on the throne. And then they finally said, there ain't no scroll that long. Stop, that's wrong. And they burst in, and he's dead. Now, this adds 
New meaning. To when you walk in the bathroom behind somebody and you say, man, it smells like somebody died up in here. <laughs> I'm just, I'm sorry. How could I pass that up? It may be where it originated. You don't know. You don't know. So, what a just dessert. He's sitting in his, on his throne in a palace in Jericho, and one man goes in. What an incredible plan. Closes the door behind him, kills the man dead on the spot, goes down the balcony, and they give him time to escape because they think he's sitting on the john. <laughs> that is a story that is awesome. And Ehud is my man because what nerve did it take? Number one. Number two, the reason Ehud has my heart is when he walked past Gilgal and he said, nope, Satan, no more, not today. I'm going back. I got goose pimples saying it. That was my man. I love him. All right. Now, and anybody that can take somebody out with that kind of a plan, you're awesome. All right. Verse 26, but Ehud had escaped. Now listen to what he does next. This is just the beginning. Now he's going to get some icing on the cake or some ice cream. Okay? Ehud had escaped while he delayed and passed beyond the stone images. And he probably walked by this time and went, <laughs> and kept on walking because he knew what he had done. And escaped to Sarah. Okay? Now, this occurred at Jericho. He escaped and made his way all, all the way to Sarah while they were waiting for the king to get out of the john. So here's what happens, all right? <clears throat> Verse 27, and it happened when he arrived that he, now you see how close he is to the mountains of Ephraim? He's at the base hills there. When he arrived, he went up in the mountains. He blew the trumpet in the mountains of Ephraim. He blew the war trumpets, okay? And led them. Oh, I'm sorry. And the children of Israel went down with him from the mountains, and he led them. He went in, he said, guys, ding dong, the king is dead. He went up in the mountain, he blew the war trumpet, and they answered. Okay? Now, <clears throat> and the children of Israel went down with him from the mountains, and he led them. Verse 28, then he said to them, follow me, for the Lord has delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. I love this. Stop. He just went and risked his life with an awesome plan that he even made the dagger for. Killed the king single-handedly in the middle of his palace. Made the escape. Came back. Rallied the cowards. And then what is his war cry? God has delivered him into your hands, boys. Go get him. He didn't say, look what I did. Now can you please go back me up, cowards? No. He does all of that. And then he comes and he says, go serve your God. God has given him to you today. That's a leader, my friend. We're not going to see many in Judges. That's a leader. Ehud rocks. All right? <clears throat> Verse 28, second half. So they went down after him, seized the fords of the Jordan leading to Moab, and did not allow anyone to cross over. And at that time, they killed about 10,000 men of Moab, all stout men of valor, not a man escaped. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for 80 years. Now, get this. He goes to Sarah, and then he blows a trumpet. He brings the, all the men down from Ephraim. And then you see where they went down to the edge? They, went, they didn't go to Jericho. They're brilliant. They ran to the Jordan where they had crossed. And it was not only, hey, we're going to beat you back. It's our turn, boys. He went to the Jordan, blocked off their escape, came in from both sides. and what? Now, stop and think about this. If you're going to push a bubble into enemy territory and you're going to take one of their cities and make it your headquarter for your king to stay in to annoy them, what kind of men do you think are behind enemy lines protecting the palace where the king's life is at stake? The baddest of the bad, right? The Navy SEALs, Green Beret. These are the 10,000. That's why the verses say the st all stout men of valor, the best of the best, 10,000 were killed in one day. 
God was back on the move because they had prayed and God had answered. So they cut them off. They brought them in. They collapsed on them. And they took out 10,000. That is awesome. Now, Ehud was one of the bravest warriors. He's my favorite. Probably, maybe all the way through. We'll wait and see. We'll wait and see. He served as a judge. Now, Othniel served 1350 to 1310. Then there's a little break period. And Ehud comes in at 1292 to 1212. Okay, that's about the time that he does it. Single-handedly takes out the king, escapes unharmed, rallies everybody, kills 10,000, gives them 80 years of peace. Now, are you ready for the Marvel character? Come on, come on. All right, how many people saw Endgame? Endgame, best Marvel movie ever made. You have to go watch it now. There was one particular person who, through deception used a dagger, and tried to kill a mean ruler. Didn't work out as good for him. But it had to be the man. Loki, you'll remember. If you've seen Endgame, you'll remember it forever. No, no, this works. Stay with it. So, and, well, it was much less successful results. We're plowing through to the end on this, boys. You're going to get 12 Marvel characters up there, and there'll be a story for every one of them. Thank you. I got a fist pump from one cool person in this group. Y'all are all old people. I'm going to get the young people up here next week to watch the next one. Not that I'm immature or anything, but... <clears throat> Who is off, Neil? Oh. I got one for him. He's coming. All right. Now, here's what I want you to get out of this, and we're done. I want you to understand how quickly the entire nation fell after... Um, uh, when Othniel went and, and gave them peace for 40 years, and as soon as he was dead, how quickly it changed. And, and that's where we are. We, I won't keep repeating it, but that's where we are as a, as a nation. But the biggest thing that I just think that is so powerful with this, stop right now. Nothing later. Don't apply this to your life when you leave. Think right now, what has crept into your life and taken the place that God had at one time or should have right now and you've never given it to him? What do you have in your life in the middle of Gilgal that belongs to God? Stop waiting for the one day that you're going to get it right. If you're not ready to get it right now, as much as he loves you, as much as he's done, as much as he's worth with all that you know you have waiting for you when you embrace him that you don't have now, with being as close as we are to the trump and we all know it and we see it all around us and you're still looking for a reason to push you to do it tomorrow, you should probably stop coming to church because you ain't real and you're just hurting people. What I'm asking you to do, if you are real, we all have things. We all have things that belong to God that we just haven't taken care of. Let it be today. He's worth it. And there's so much more of him for you to discover. And I'm going to get easier, but it's going to get sweeter. And when you, when you find it, when you know, most of you know right now what's sitting in Gilgal that doesn't belong there. You know what you should do? You should turn around and you should whisper to the world, and you should whisper to all the fallen angels that try to invade your house and defeat your family, you should whisper, I have a secret message for you from God. My house is covered under the blood of Jesus Christ. I am his. This house is his. My children are his. I am taking back what you, what you took. I will no longer stand for it. I am a child of God, and my my father wants to take care of me, and I've just let you be here, and you don't have authority anymore. Turn around and whisper a secret. And stop putting it off. And I'm not saying it's going to get easier. I'm saying they'll bring more, and they'll come at you harder. But I'm saying it's the right thing. What is the place that you once took for God? And made it your beautiful picture of Jericho. Look what God did for me. Only to forget about it later and let it be overrun. Um, 
so, so, God's got to be so tired of the Christian game. And I want you to get this with all my heart. Listen to me. The world around us has stopped playing games. The world around us is sacrificing jobs, sacrificing uh, their, their social status, sacrificing money, sacrificing anything and everything to push their agenda with all of their heart with severe malice to take you and your faith and your children. And yet we're sitting on our happy little lives playing church. God deserves so much more. But we always have an excuse. We always have a reason he understands. We always have a reason why it doesn't involve me. The bottom line is you're the one missing out. God can do it without you. God wants you involved and he wants you serious and he wants you passionate because you're the one that will benefit even when it's costing you. It's his favor to you to involve you in the battle. So I'm telling you, because he's worth it, because he has so much more in store for you, because he's real, doggone it, take whatever is in your life and say, I have been bought with a price and I will do whatever I need to do and I will begin to live the way I should live. And do it now. Nobody's impressed because you cuss a little less or you go to church sometimes. Let them be impressed because they see how crazy in love you are with God no matter what it costs. Stop praying at Him and start praying with Him. Stop doing well because you want your prayers answered and do well because He's so worth it you want to make Him happy. And understand you're still going to fall and He's going to keep picking you up. But let this be the time that we turn around at Gilgal. Let's stand for prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, every, everything that I, that I pray about, every problem that I talk about anyone having, I know that I have had or am having or will have it. And you show me such real love. You show it to me theologically in your word and you show it to me in how you meet me in prayer and how you answer prayers and how you change my heart and how your long-suffering and the blessings that you've given me in the trials that you put me through in everything in life, you prove it. And I thank you that you love the imperfect perfectly. Thank you that you don't give up. Lord, all you ask is that our heart stays in the game and that we be here to live and love for you no matter how many times we fall, we get back up because you're worth it. Help everybody realize that. It's not their performance. It's their heart. And then, Lord, let us realize it's time, whatever the cost, to let our life be about you or not at all about you. There is no lukewarm. I pray you do what only your word and only your spirit can do to every heart that's in here and every heart that hears in any way this message. Let us come alive for you. We praise you. We love you. We glorify you. In your precious son, our king's name, our brother who came and took on our flesh to die because he was proud to call us his brothers and sisters and then gave us his glory. Lord, give him all the glory. It's in his name we pray. Amen. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the stand in Christ alone who took on flesh fullness of God in helpless babe this gift of love and righteousness scorned by 
Nothing but 